This video presents a simulation-based approach to handling chance constraints in a more general setting. In the video titled Chance Constraints, we introduced what a chance constraint is in general. Having a constraint like this, the chance constraint is a relaxation of that, where the original constraint only has to be satisfied with a certain probability alpha. Of course, this only becomes relevant when one or more of the parameters in that constraint are stochastic. This approach is especially nice when the constraint is soft, i.e. it might be okay to violate the constraint. But it also works with hard constraints. However, in that case you probably want a larger value of alpha. In the first video we only considered stochasticity in the right-hand side parameters b. We also assumed that the individual right-hand sides of each constraint were independent. Furthermore, we assumed that each of the b's followed their own normal distribution. And finally, we had to limit ourselves to only less than or equal to or greater than or equal to constraints, and only to linear programs with continuous variables. Together, these are pretty significant limitations of the approach, so in this video we present a more general approach based on simulation, which gets rid of most of these limitations. Okay, so what are we looking at now? Let's say we have a problem where we want to maximize some linear function of the decision variables x. And we have a set of constraints like this. x are the decision variables and psi is the stochastic element. The gi's are simply the functions that define the constraints. We have written the constraints like this before, where the a's and b's could then be stochastic. But from here on, we use this a bit more general definition. Some of the decision variables could be reals and some could be integer. We call this a mixed integer program. Now the random size follow a joint distribution, meaning that they are not independent. However, we assume that their distributions are known. Beforehand, we've looked at individual chance constraints. For example, given an i, we have that that specific constraint should be satisfied with the probability alpha i. We could then calculate the probability that all of the constraints were satisfied by multiplying these alphas. With the method we will be using in this video, we instead consider a single alpha that just specify that the probability that all constraints of the model are satisfied should be more than alpha. This is where we want to linearize the chance constraint so that we can use a standard solution approach. In this case, we're solving a MIP, so we could use something like branch and bound. But the issue is that the problem we are solving might not be very nice. We might have dependencies in the random variables or they might follow some nasty distributions. Just to give you a quick example of this, consider a network problem, where a truck has to deliver goods to a set of customers. The truck might start its journey at the depot and then has to follow the roads or edges on the graph to the customers. Of course, the idea is to find the route that minimizes the total distance traveled by the truck. But let's now say that there is a time window for each customer in which the goods have to be delivered. If the truck arrives early, it doesn't matter too much, it can just wait. But we want to be able to give some guarantee that the truck is not late. For example, that it's late with less than 5% probability. Now if the travel times on the roads are deterministic, we do not need chance constraints. We can simply make a constraint that ensures that the truck is always on time. But in the real world, this is never the case. Traffic might vary a lot, and so we decide to model the travel times as normal distributed parameters. Now consider a solution to this problem, i.e. a route like this one. The truck visits all three customers and then returns to the depot. If we were to model the arrival time at the first customer, that is easy enough. The travel time from node 0 to 1 is normally distributed, and hence the arrival time will be so as well. But we might be early, in which case we have to wait a bit before leaving for customer 2. This graph shows the service time of customer 1. The left tail accumulates at the start of the delivery window. Now the travel time from node 1 to 2 is also normally distributed, but due to having to wait at the first customer in some case, the corresponding service time of customer 2 follows a distribution like this. This effect would of course accumulate throughout the customers, which makes it very hard to even tell, given a certain solution, what the probability is for that solution to be feasible and in general makes it hard to formulate the chance constraint analytically. Instead we use sampling. We have this chance constraint, which we can also write in its matrix form like this. 
We do not care about the individual constraints anyway, we want them all to be satisfied with probability alpha. We then generate s samples of the psi vector and introduce new binary variables y. We have a y for each of the samples and the y's are defined such that yl, which is the y associated with sample l, is one if and only if the solution x satisfies the chance constraint with that particular sample of the psi vector. Now that we have these new auxiliary variables, the y's, we can introduce a new constraint. This constraint simply sums the y's and divides by the total number of samples s. If this number is greater than or equal to alpha, we know that according to our sampling, the solution satisfies the original chance constraint. Of course, this will only always give an estimate of the real model. Since we are only doing a finite set of simulations or samples, we only get an approximation. Increasing the size of s will improve the confidence of that approximation. In other words, even though the model tells us that we should expect a solution to be feasible with, for example, 95% probability, it might be that in real life that probability is only 90%, or maybe it's 99%. In a moment, I will present a technique to help combat this uncertainty. But let's first look at how we can model the new y variables such that they are defined in the way we want them to be. We've introduced this new probability constraint, which needs the y variables to be one exactly if the solution is feasible given the corresponding sample. The way we ensure that is to introduce this new set of constraints on the y variables. The probability constraint wants the y's to be one because it wants the left hand side to be greater than or equal to alpha. But whenever a specific yl is set to one, then the right hand side of what I call the y constraints will be zero meaning that we essentially get the constraint in its original form. The constraint has to be satisfied with the corresponding psi l. On the other hand, if a given yl is zero, then the y constraint does not need to be satisfied since the right hand side of the y constraint becomes one times a very large number m, meaning that the solution x does not need to be feasible for sample l. Together, these constraints ensure that the y's behave as intended. We have seen that this is a very strong method that works for many problems as long as we are able to simulate the parameters. Let's conclude by looking at some of the weaknesses of the method. We already talked about the fact that the method only provides an approximation of the real problem. If the number of samples is too low, the confidence that the solution to the sample-based model is feasible might not match the actual numbers of the original model. But why not just make a larger number of samples then? Well, this ties into the next weakness of the method. Even if the original problem is a linear program with only continuous variables, it becomes a mixed integer program the moment we introduce the y variables. That means that we cannot use simplex. We instead need something like branch and bound. Increasing the number of samples will increase the number of constraints as well as the number of variables in the problem, hence making it a lot harder to solve. The biggest offender here is probably the big M constraint. Big M constraints in general can make mixed integer programs hard to solve with branch and bound. This is because the branch and bound model relies on bounds generated by solving linear programming relaxations of the model. And Big M constraints can affect the quality of these LP bounds quite significantly. Therefore, it might be relevant to consider a simple alternative to increasing the number of samples. And that is to make another simulation with a completely new set of samples. This time, the simulation is not used to make a deterministic model to be solved, but instead we simply check if the solution from earlier is feasible for each of the new samples. In the end, that will give us a new estimate on the probability that the solution is feasible for the real problem. Because we do not have to solve a problem this time, we can choose the number of samples much higher, and hence the probability we get will on average be a better estimate of the true probability. Just to sum things up, 1. Simulate S samples and create a deterministic model based on those samples. 2. Solve the model and get the optimal solution, x. 3. Make R new samples, where R is significantly larger than S, and then calculate an estimate of the true probability that the solution is feasible. Notice that this method, of course, does not change the solution we get in point 2. Hence, it does not improve it in the same way that increasing the value of S would. However, it might be helpful in finding cases where the value of alpha used in point 2 is significantly different from the true value. For example, 
we might want a solution that is feasible 95% of the time. So we use an alpha of 0.95 when solving the deterministic model. But when we do the larger simulation in point three, we find that it seems much more likely that the solution is actually only feasible 90% of the time. If we were persistent in wanting a higher probability, we could then go back and increase S and resolve the deterministic model. On the other hand, if we were satisfied with the 90% or even better, if the test in point three also showed 95%, we could simply stop knowing now with much more confidence that the solution would indeed be feasible 95% of the time in practice. The follow-up video chance constraints and simulation and example provides an example of this method being applied in practice.